morning, just about still morning. Uh, I sometimes get to follow Tim Peake, and now I get to follow uh, the woman who's talking about the Rosetta mission. Um, so not only am I from government, it's before lunch, and I'm following a fascinating, um, a fascinating presentation. But obviously, I'm going to change tack a little uh, for us. Uh, and I was asked to cover this kind of big picture theme of delivering growth through um, the UK civil space strategy, but trying to pick up to make it relevant for this um, audience. Um, how researchers, perhaps researchers at Imperial, can collaborate more to, to make that happen, um, and also kind of what the future of funding looks like in, in the sector. So uh, you had an introduction from someone else in the agency last year, I think, um, so I'm not going to go through that again, uh, but just a quick reminder of the civil space strategy um, and the goal. We're trying to grow our UK space industry by 400% uh, to a 40 billion sector by 2030. And I suppose, you know, I'm the director of growth and you'd expect me to be talking to industry and so on. But I do want to just emphasise that we, we are just as interested in uh, growth through government, the education aspect of growth, the skills aspect of growth, the science and innovation aspects of growth. It's the whole kind of wheel of activity. Um, just a quick update on the kind of space sector health. We, we commission a survey every couple of years which looks at, we, we call it the size and health of the UK space um, sector. We've had the headlines, the headlines were published uh, of, the, of the latest survey looking at 2012 um, were published at Farnborough and we'll get the more detailed report um, later in, uh, probably later in the autumn sometime. But it's showing good healthy growth, we're still growing, which is a bit of a relief when you're the director of growth and you've been in post for the two years that the survey um, was covering. Employment's up um, and growing well. Um, and we're contributing now 11 billion um, every year to the UK economy. In perspective, though, that's the size of the British film industry. Um, so as somebody who I heard speak recently uh, said, you know, we're still quite au couture. We're not quite, you know, top shop yet um, in terms of the, the, the kind of size of industry that we're going for. So very ambitious what we're going for, but we're still um, quite a niche sector. And I suppose one of the themes that I wanted to get across was this idea that, you know, a lot of this growth is coming in the downstream applications and services area. And we keep saying it, but this means that a whole load of people that aren't yet engaged with space don't think about themselves as part of the space sector, need to start being part of the space sector. And I think that has quite a profound um, impact on the kind of collaborations that we're looking for people to make, uh, the kind of conversations, the kind of join-ups, the kind of spin-outs um, that we're looking for. And I, I think it raises a real challenge to the identity of the whole sector, actually. Um, and here we are at, at, at Space Lab, and we've got a picture of a satellite. Um, and actually, how do you turn um, an industry which is quite sexy, you know, we've just heard about one sexy mission, into something that's much more every day, you know, it's about applications and services that people are losing, but with the, without losing the kind of excitement and dynamism that, from a government perspective, attracts funding and, and it enables things to happen. So just from a UK Space Agency perspective, there's sort of three pillars to our activities. You'll, you'll know these, but I'll just mention them in terms of, you know, these are the kind of areas of funding. We've got our national initiatives, um, and that's something that we very much are keen to grow as an agency. We want to do more national, uh, more national programmes. We still do the vast majority of our activity through the European Space Agency in terms of our funding. Um, and it's still very much the ambition to continue to grow that budget to give new opportunities for people to um, have the kind of, do the kind of innovative science uh, and increasingly the commercial activities that um, ESA undertake. Um, and we are also, because growth um, we anticipate is largely, or a big proportion of it is going to come from exports and from direct investment to the UK, we have to keep collaborating with other space agencies and we're very, um, we're very kind of alive to the international picture. So for example, the, the situation that we have with Russia at the moment has a profound impact on our space collaborations. What do we do about that? And what does that mean for the resilience of our sector um, are things that we look at from an agency perspective. So our focus, I mean, I put this slide in because I looked at the Imperial Space Lab slide, which was one of the introductory slides earlier on. And there's a big overlap um, between a lot of the things that go on through Imperial Space Lab and all of the areas that we're looking for. 
Um, and the one I would add in terms of growing the sector is the increasing need for business savvy people with entrepreneurial skills to complement the skills of scientists, researchers, people who can do the science and the innovation um, to really grow the sector. And those people and the data analysts and those kind of skills are increasingly something that we need. Um, and this is just a reminder, I mean, some of these you've done through Imperial, um, of some of the great science and some of the great achievements commercially and scientifically that the UK has. We're quite a well-organised sector. Um, there's a good relationship. We have this thing in government called industrial strategy, where we try not to pick winners, but we try and have an ongoing partnership with a sector where we can talk about the development of the sector. And that's actually pretty well developed in the space sector. Um, back in 2010, so the last Labour government, um, the innovation and growth strategy was brought out. And that's something that's been refreshed over the last um, couple of years, um, culminating in a kind of government response to um, uh, the Space Growth Action Plan, as it was called. And really, there were two aspects, that inward investment and export focus, and the need to really get to grips with what the markets with high growth potential were that the UK needed to start um, going after. And the other thing that's different about the strategy this time is that there's a lot more focus on implementation, um, which I think is a good thing. So there's a, a sort of partnership right across uh, the sector um, trying to implement the recommendations that were made. Uh, one of the key recommendations, and I'll, I'll sort of make no apology for referring to somewhere else in the UK when talking at what is clearly a very well-established campus of activity here, um, was the establishment of this thing called the UK Space Gateway. Um, and that is something that we've done. Um, it's at Harwell in Oxford. And it's, it's relevant to the whole country. And why? Because we're a small, a relatively small country, we have to have a focal point for national growth. Government wants us to make sure that growth is distributed all around the country, not just in London and the southeast, which the figures tell us that it, it largely is. So here we have a, a set of activities, a campus of activities, but it's about an attitude. It's about an international, outward-looking, collaborative partnerships attitude that the UK needs to take to attract people to invest into the UK, to get ourselves into the kind of partnerships that we need to have, to show off some of the things that we do, not just at Harwell, but all over the country, for people to come and be able to talk to each other over a coffee and have exciting ideas. But it, it, it is, in many senses, a, for the government certainly, a projection of our increasing power in space. And one very overt symbol of that um, is the establishment of the um, EXAT, the European Space Agency Centre um, at Harwell, which is a very significant development in terms of the Britain's kind of um, place in European space, which I think is, is, is really becoming quite different. So just a picture of the Harwell campus and all the lovely facilities. The point here is, keep clicking because there's still things coming up you know things are being built if you go there you'll see things happening that will continue to happen and I believe it will end up having a, a kind of quite a national center there's a, a new development partner there very ambitious um, and I think it's an exciting um, an exciting development for the UK so what does it mean um, sort of trying to bring it back to what does it mean for people here what does it mean for the rest of the UK um, I think um, the point I wanted to make behind this slide was at the moment, most of the money that goes into the research and the developments and so on, it flows, some of it flows through the UK Space Agency, some of it through Innovate UK, TSB, um, you know, various other funding pots through the other research councils and so on. Increasingly, looking at the way that the space sector is going, there is money out there um, in other pots. There's the, there's the European money through things like Horizon 2020, which is very focused on things like solving societal challenges. But there's also big pots of money through the structural funds, um, the, the local enterprise partnerships after the disruption of the kind of regional architecture once this government came in. You know, things are getting much more organised around the space sector. A number of the local enterprise partnerships have realised that they've got some capabilities in space and they want to join up and together you know, particularly in places like, you know, I'll mention Cornwall just because it's uh, an area that can attract a lot of European funding. You know, people are really looking for um, opportunities to collaborate. There are people out there who want to know how to connect. And um, that's why Harwell so significant. It's a place for people who don't really know about the space community, but think that they want a piece of it to connect with people who are already part of the space community um, and grow things. It's, um, you could say it's a bit, um, you know, I hope it doesn't come over as too Stalinist because it's not meant to be, but you have to have a focal point, otherwise collaborations don't happen um, in a productive way. 
Um, and um, it, th there's a strong sense of wishing to kind of ca capability map, understand what facilities and things we've got available, and for the space agency perspective, to really understand what the landscape looks like, both across the um, academic and research base, in industry, um, in you know what's happening in the little workshops and on the business parks, all over the place, to try and put a picture together about how we move behind these kind of markets that we've identified. So. I've said a lot of that. I'm trying to tell you that it's relevant to you, really, um, and I hope I've explained why. The Innovation and Growth Strategy, as I said, had a big focus on markets, and it tried to focus on growing markets that would bring over a billion pounds a year into the UK economy. It's probably a bit small to read, but it's available in the public documents, and many of you may have looked at it. And if you're out there on a sort of mixture of ages and, and, and people who are you know, changing careers or whatever, whatever, wherever you sit in this sector, this is quite a good guide, I think, to some of the potential areas that we might start to move into. Um, and I'm going to move on to talk about one of them, mainly because it takes up quite a lot of my time at the moment, but just to sort of explain the opportunity. Um, space planes, something that we sort of announced at Farnborough this year that we were looking at identifying um, the criteria around the creation of a UK space port. The government has a, a strongly stated ambition to have a UK, an operational UK space port by 2018, which isn't very far away. Um, and we are working very actively on it. We're looking at the regulatory environment. We're looking at the, you know, where this spaceport might be, which raises all sorts of interesting questions. And, you know, this is going to cause a lot of potential for everybody who's involved in space. First of all, you know, if you want a, an exciting ride into space and you've got a lot of money, great. But actually, there's a lot more to it than that. You know, we're really going after trying to get some kind of UK launch capability, which I think could be quite game changing for the UK. Um, there's all sorts of things like the development of a supply chain that needs to go around all of that. There will undoubtedly be, you know, a, a kind of gateway around this spaceport, assuming we get one, um, which will offer all sorts of kind of campus opportunities for people and, you know, hopefully will stimulate people's imagination. And also, you know, one of the options is to have this kind of microgravity research angle to um, a space plane operation. So, I mention it because, you know, it's uh, from, from the innovation and growth strategy and the action plan that we formulated. This is an area that government is very active in um, and commercially there's a lot of activity. But there's a whole lot of uh, stuff that, you know, needs to happen, particularly supply chain, studies into how we can make it all happen and so on. And actually putting it all together, you know, what are the manufacturing techniques that sit behind all of this? Um, as the technology will almost certainly come from somewhere else to a certain extent, you know, what's the technology transfer opportunity? You know, that just to get you thinking. Another area, completely different direction, um, is uh, Space for Smarter Government. It's a program also in my area. And it's about, I mean, it seems extraordinary. It's a bit like government suddenly realizing that it can use IT, you know, it can use space. And actually, a lot of people are using, um, in government, use space without really realizing it. It's got a big uh, growth potential. Um, it's got a big export potential. We could export a lot of those services. Again, there are a lot of opportunities here. There's funding behind it. You know, there's a, an, another opportunity to tap local funding pots. Um, and there's an opportunity to, to you know, the, we're tackling the deficit in, uh, in, in government and we're doing it by cutting public spending. One of the corollaries of that and the opportunities of that for space is that space offers big efficiencies for government and therefore could be an area that could receive um, funding of that nature. So that's the, the philosophy behind the programme. You probably can't see that, but this, this was the light bulb moment for a load of uh, government departments that they were actually already using space um, assets uh, to conduct their normal business. And this is something that will push out. And you'll remember, um, you may have heard of this kind of eight great technologies that government um, sort of identified as key enabling technologies for the future and space enabled um, applications are one of those. And I think, you know, having that in the mindset and, and hopefully having that survive into the next administration and so on will be a really important thing for sustaining public spending in space, which I think uh, is absolutely vital. So this is just a bit about the programme, but it's, it's about neutrally putting together public sector people who have requirements with people who have expertise about using space. So, the underpinning, sort of moving towards wrapping up really. Um, the goals for space, it's a big, it's a big, big challenge. Um, and it's pretty resource hungry sector. Um, the R&D pro investment profile for space um, needs to be higher. 
it's a sort of around 10%, maybe a bit less than 10% at the moment. So, you know, okay compared to something like IT, but not very big compared to something like high value manufacturing, for example. Um, and we're in a situation where whatever, whoever wins the next election, uh, it's highly likely that the squeeze on public spending will continue. We'll probably go to almost exclusively using cuts in public spending to uh, service our debts as a nation. So for a sector that relies heavily on public investment, that could be bad news, which is why I emphasise government use of space as a way to, to kind of uh, make the case for increasing government funding. And there has to be more industry funding and other co-funding coming into the sector as well. Um, I think there's a big challenge coming from the identity of the whole sector and, you know, uh, increasingly we'll see kind of synergies between the civil and the military side which raises some issues but really it's all about how people are going to use these applications and services for the future. Um, inward investment um, is something that we're very actively encouraging but again that's a potentially could be a threat to the existing sector or be seen as an opportunity that's something that needs working through but for people in this room and people who are conducting research looking for funding you know making those partnerships spotting those new partnerships understanding who's coming what they're looking at you know that's all part of um, sort of building your offer um, for the future and we will continue to use and invest in uh, facilities and uh, items at Harwell um, at the UK Space Gateway to act as our shop window for what we're doing. And actually just on the campus, we're trying to grow the number of jobs there as well. But actually, it's a drop in the ocean compared to our target of 100,000 jobs directly uh, employed by space by 2030. And we're, we're about 34,000 now, so quite a way to go. We have a lot of strengths in the UK and you have a lot on your Imperial Space Labs slide. The trick is, how do you grow them? How do you spot the new areas? Um, and how do you select what the new, what the new things are going to be uh, without sort of heading off down the, the, the wrong alleyway? I think the future looks very exciting for this sector despite all of the challenges. I think it is firmly embedded um, in the public psyche, we've got, you know, we've got Rosetta, which is huge public interest around that, huge sort of space sector interest. Um, these are all opportunities to sell our sector. We've got the Tim Peake mission coming up next year. We're doing a lot in the agency and there's a lot going on around the country to sell that. And there is a fascination amongst the public about understanding some of the basic science questions and people like the applications and services that come. Um, so I think we'll start to get to some of these um, answers and exploit some of these opportunities. And I hope that a lot of people will start to see the sector as somewhere where they can have a very rewarding, um, well remunerated uh, career in this sector and hopefully have the, the innovative ideas that go with it. There is funding available, but I think it's a challenge. I'll be honest, from a government perspective, I think maintaining uh, government funding in the space sector is going to be a challenge over the next few years because of the need to continue to pay off um, our national debt, to, for want of a better word. In order to make the most of the funding available, you've got to look creatively at new pots, things you may never have considered before um, and think innovatively. In order to attract funding, I think people will have to focus, you know, increasingly you talk to research councils and others, they are trying to be more strategic about their funding. And I think you've got to be smart about demonstrating an impact around the strategic areas that research councils, government, you know, the, the, the funding areas are, are, are looking at. And this regional funding dimension and the downstream, you know, you might think, well, you know, I, I, I like working in upstream space, but there's, that's where the opportunity is. Uh, and the challenge is how to, um, how to make that happen. Um, and I, I suppose I, the, the final thought is, though, if UK doesn't grasp this opportunity, you know, one of the reasons that we're, we're so, sort of pressing after the space planes, space ports opportunity uh, from a government angle is we will get left behind. I think we're standing, you know, with lots of exciting things about to happen. We're standing on the, uh, the beginning of a new era. I think there's a real sense of a new era. There's a real sense that it really is possible for ordinary people to get out into space in some of our lifetime, maybe not my lifetime, but some people in the room's lifetime. And what does that mean for us? And what does it mean for our relationship with our own planet? And what does it mean for the kind of applications and services that service that new way of life? So, um, yeah, that's how we're going to get to the 400% growth. Uh, and hopefully I've, I've sort of talked to you a bit about how you need to think um, in terms of tapping some of the opportunities that there are um, to grow your own careers and grow your own research or, uh, sort of interests um, in this area. 
we're always happy to talk and get in touch um, whether you've got questions about you know what the regulatory regime means for you you know what what funding pots are available um, I may not be able to help you in fact probably won't but I'm sure I've got a colleague who can um, and I just want to sort of sell the message that although we're a small agency we're absolutely committed um, to getting the kind of excellence in this sector for the UK um, that we'd all like to see so I'll stop there thank you